Good evening. You look good. You look really good. It's a hot crowd. We're going to have a terrific evening. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Marty Kaplan. I'm the director of the Norman Lear Center, which is at USC, the, at the Annenberg School for Communication and Journalism. And we're really, really thrilled uh, that this evening is happening. The Lear Center's mission is to study and shape the impact of media and entertainment on society. We've been doing it uh, since 2000, and uh, we couldn't be doing it without the uh, generosity of Norman and Lynn Lear, uh, who are amazing philanthropists, and in the area of environment, not least. We have lots of different projects. I invite you to learn about them at learcenter.org. Our newest project you might have read about in the New York Times the other week. Uh, it's funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Knight Foundation, who decided it was about time to figure out and to innovate in the area of how do you know if media makes a difference? Does it change things? What are the best ways that can be developed in this age of uh, uh, big data to do that? And we're launching uh, an exciting new program to do that, the Media Impact Project. And we have other projects, and the oldest and uh, best funded and best articulated project is Hollywood Health and Society, which is an effort to inspire and inform the creative community so that when they talk about issues, when you talk about issues uh, like the environment, that you have uh, access to the kind of information and stories uh, that you need. So tonight is a collaboration between Hollywood Health and Society and the Environmental Media Association, Emma. Uh, Emma has been up to this since the year, uh, gosh, 19, 24 years now? 24 years. So uh, Emma has been working uh, this terrain uh, for that long, and we are thrilled to be able to partner with uh, a leader in, in this area tonight. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to see an am amazing movie, Chasing Ice, which I've seen a number of times on a small screen. I'm really excited to see it on a big screen. Um, we're then going to have a panel discussion, uh, including uh, part of the creative team who made it and a couple of scientists who will tell us why we should not just slit our wrists and... Uh, uh, despair about all the stuff that's going on. We'll have questions and answers, and uh, there will be food, more food, dessert in the lobby later on. If you are uh, tw live tweeting tonight, and I know who you are, uh, the hashtag for the evening is Chasing Ice. Uh, what I'd like to do now is introduce to you the director of our Hollywood Health and Society program, please welcome Sandra de Castro Buffington. Hello, everybody, and welcome. We're so glad to have you with us tonight. I'd like to start by thanking five of our wonderful funding partners Barr, Grantham, Skoll, Climate Works, and Anonymous for making this screening possible. And I'd also like to, to thank the staff of Hollywood Health and Society, the Norman Lear Center, and the Environmental Media Association for organizing this evening for us. So thank you all. So Hollywood Health and Society, which is a program of the Norman Lear Center, recognizes the profound impact of entertainment media on knowledge and behavior. Like it or not, people are learning from television and movies. And that's why Hollywood Health and Society serves as a free resource to writers and producers to connect you all with experts on climate change and health for your scripts. We help writers make their stories more compelling by making them more realistic and more accurate. So why does that matter? To give you a sense of how it impacts viewers, 10% of viewers signed up to become organ donors after seeing a single episode on organ transplantation on the show Numbers. 
Over 8 million viewers learned for the first time how to prevent the spread of HIV from mother to child from a single episode of Grey's Anatomy. And over 11% of viewers of a storyline on 90210 about breast cancer and the BRCA gene called their doctors to uh, schedule screenings. And of course, we've heard a lot about this from Angelina Jolie recently. Their stories reach viewers at disproportionate risk, the viewers who might never ask the questions otherwise. OK, so how does this work? If you're a writer or producer in the audience tonight, you can call Hollywood Health and Society, and we'll connect you to science experts and to health experts. We'll give you real stories of real people and case studies for your creative teams. We'll arrange customized story tours to take you to NASA's Jet Propulsion Lab or into East and South LA to learn about environmental justice on the ground. We'll also evaluate the impact of your stories. We can review scripts, your websites, your social media. And finally, we recognize exemplary TV storylines on climate change and on health at our annual Sentinel for Health Awards ceremony. And by the way, we're accepting entries right now. And there is a flyer at the table at the door. So if you'd like more information, please take one on your way out tonight. So tonight, we bring you one of the most compelling climate change films to date. It's award-winning. And we're very lucky that following the film, we'll be able to hear from the producer and the writer. We'll also hear from a scientist from the Jet Propulsion Lab at NASA. And we'll also hear from one of the founding members of the UCLA Climate Solutions Program, who is now with the XPRIZE Foundation. We hope you're all entertained. We hope that you're informed, and we hope that you're inspired to write about climate change in your storylines. Thank you. The cool thing about all those services is that they're free. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce to you the president of the Environmental Media Association. She has been president of Emma since there has been a Norman Lear Center. Please welcome Debbie Levin. I didn't realize that. That's very cool, actually. Um, thank you, Marty. Well, as you've heard a couple times here tonight, Emma has been around for 24 years. Um, we were founded by Lynn and Norman Lear and Cindy and Alan Horn with a mission to mobilize the entertainment industry in a global effort to educate people about environmental problems and inspire them into action, which was incredibly unique 24 years ago. And, and the media was nothing like it is right now. But educating and motivating the public about sustainability through all forms of media is still our core focus and it's more important than ever. Through our boards, we have the privilege of a close connection with the entertainment industry. We've been involved with storylines, the creating of two of the major networks' annual Green Weeks of Environmental Content. We created the Emma Green Seal, the industry standard for productions, and maximized our reach with utilizing the incredible voices of our celebrity supporters to role model green behaviors. Um, little example, uh, about a week ago, Marty wrote this amazing article that I'm sure most of you read in the Huffington Post, a uh, climate change article, and we thought, oh, we're going to ask a couple of our friends to tweet that. In two hours, we had five million views from a couple of tweets. Ali is here tonight, too. One of our amazing tweeters is here and really, really helped us, Ali Sudal. Um, our Emma Young Hollywood Board, we, we now have passion and opportunities to utilize the media in these ways, ways that we never imagined in 1989. One tweet, as I said, from popular talent can garner millions and millions of, of views, retweets, followers. This is how information is shared at this point, and this is the media. Um, the need for something to say never ends. And you, our creative community, have been so generous with your access and understanding of the power of words and images. Popular entertainment in, in all its incarnations is how people learn and how people form their opinions. In October, we'll hold the 23rd Annual Emma Awards that honor film, 
TV, digital productions, and individuals that increase public awareness of environmental issues and inspire personal actions on these issues. We're so proud that the Emmas have become the premier green event for the entertainment industry. We have the opportunity to educate a global audience and you guys have the opportunity to get a really beautiful Tiffany Award, which I love seeing on series because this is so funny because we actually, when you watch television shows, we have so many of you great writers who have won um, Emma Awards in the past for various programs, and I see them as props. What was, I forgot what the last thing I saw it on, but it was on a show that was just out, and I saw it on the desk, and it was like sort of, you know, a, a, um, a just, you know, part of the decoration, and I'm like, oh my God, there's an Emma Award. It's kind of like sightings that we see. Um, some of our past Emma Award recipients, I include President, um, Vice President Al Gore, President, that was like a, a, a weird uh, mistake. Um, <laughs> Ted Turner, Jeff Skoll, Dave Matthews, Justin Timberlake, Elon Musk, Jessica Alba, The Lorax, Veep, Real Time with Bill Maher, CSI, all of the CSIs, um, and of course, Chasing Ice. We're at a crucial time in our Earth's history. Climate change is no longer abstract. It's sadly the impetus behind unnatural weather catastrophes with a that are happening with alarming regularity. Writers and producers of content have the power to enlighten the public to support behaviors and candidates that will work to curtail the carbon that's the engine behind the weather events that have taken over our Earth. With storylines that inform as well as entertain, we can motivate change faster than any government entity. We can motivate few through viewers. And that is the most powerful tool. Thank you all so much for being here tonight and everything you do to educate through your art. And now, the film. Thank you. Do you want to start? Yeah, we can start. But so just, I just have to say something. I've seen this film. This is my third time seeing the film. The first time I saw it was actually at the Lear's house on a big screen, but not this big. Not this big, but pretty big for a house. Then I watched the film on my computer as I was looking for time codes for the perfect clip for the Emma Awards. Not the best way to see it, but very intense. This is amazing to see on this big screen. The, it was so much more visceral, I have to say, that because I was talking to Paula before and I was telling her this stuff, but you could literally feel the, the crunch of the snow and the, just the magnitude of all of it. I just, this is just such a beautiful gift to be able to see it like this. So thank you guys again for, for what you do. Um, okay, um, I would like to introduce our panelists. Perfect timing. Sorry, we um, all have running water. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so happy to introduce uh, Paula Dupre Pressman. Paula has worked for more than 16 years as an associate producer for filmmaker Chris Columbus um, and 1492 Pictures. She's been part of many successful feature film projects, including Mrs. Doubtfire, Home Alone 2, Lost in New York, Rent, Harry Potter, and The Prisoner of Akabazan. How do I say that? I'm, I don't have... Azkaban. Azkaban. See, my kids aren't the right age, so I don't know how to say that. Um, and the Chamber of Secrets, Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, Stepmom, and Jingle All the Way. She was a producer for the Academy Award-winning film The Cove, also an Emma Award winner, by the way, and uh, 2009 became a producer for the award-winning documentary Chasing Ice. Paula was also honored with the Producer of the Year Award in 2010 by the Producers Guild of America for her work on The Cove. Next, I would like to introduce uh, Mark Monroe. Mark is an award-winning documentary filmmaker whose writing credits include the multi-award-winning Chasing Ice, the Academy Award-winning The Cove, Last Play at Shea, The Pat Tillman Story, and Morning Light, which he also directed. He's produced biography-style television programs that include Fearless, Beyond the Glory, Project Greenlight, Titanic, Secrets Revealed, and The Greatest, Muhammad Ali. Mark has also been working on numerous documentary features on such wide-ranging subjects as Formula One racing, Somali pil pirates, mountain climbing, and, and the ocean explorer Sylvia Earle. He's also working on The Singing Planet with director Louis Sohoyas. How did I do with that? 
Luis changed his name because you absolutely cannot pronounce it, um, to film The Cove. Mark won the 2010 Best Documentary Script Award from the Writers Guild of America for his work on The Cove. Okay, and now to me, I would like to introduce Dr. Josh Willis. Down there, yes. And Josh is the lead NASA scientist on the Jason satellite missions, which measure the rising oceans from space. He's one of the world's leading experts on global sea rise level, sea level rise, and the ocean's role in global warming and climate change. He has a PhD in oceanography from Scripps in San Diego, and currently works at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. So welcome, Josh. Thank you. And last but definitely not least, I would like to introduce Dr. Paul Bungie. Paul is a senior director for prize development at the XPRIZE Foundation. Before joining the foundation, he served as the founding executive director of the UCLA Center for Climate Change Solutions. He is also a researcher at the UCLA Institute of the Environment and Sustainability. And Paul was trained in biology at the University of Southern California and earned a PhD from UC Berkeley. So welcome. Thank you. We're going to start with our first questions. Um, Mark, as a documentary filmmaker, you've worked on lots of different issues. Which issue is the one that you are really passionate about? Not that we're like pushing you to say the environment or anything, but. <laughs> uh, the one that I would be currently working on, I guess. Whenever you uh, uh, take on one of these projects, you become you know, completely invested. And I've been um, fortunate, very fortunate uh, to, to have a, um, a career to be able to kind of like be a mini expert on a few things for a little while and get to, to hear kind of the, the cutting edge, the leading voices in these issues um, from time to time. So it's, it's, it's been very fulfilling. Okay, and Mark, how did this film come about? That's a more entertaining question probably. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's, you know, Paula and I were fortunate enough, I was fortunate enough to work with Paula on the Cove and she called me after the Cove and said, oh, you know, there's this other movie and it, it involves a photographer, Louisville was a photographer, it involves a very, uh, you know, critically acclaimed photographer, he lives in Boulder and I was just like, it can't be another one, you know, I was like, <laughs> really? Uh, and she said, yeah, but it's this, these kids that are working with him. Just, you know, just talk to him once and, and we'll go from there. And I talked to Jeff, who you saw in the film, and he sounded like he was about 12 at the time I talked to him on the phone. Uh, but he was uh, unbelievably passionate. And, um, and I knew if Paula was recommending him to me and this story to me, that there was something there. And... Uh, I just, I, I'll never forget the first time meeting Jeff. You know, w when you watch this film, James Baylock comes off as a, you know, a very motivated guy, a guy with a lot of perseverance. Jeff uh, probably matches him in determination because, I mean, he lived with this thing for three or four or five years before we ever, you know, had a, a prayer of getting it done. But he would not let it die. And it, it was uh, it was fascinating. It was great. So that's how I came on board and got hooked up with Paula again, and the whole thing started all over. <laughs> Going to Paula. Yeah. Okay, this is what I want to know. How did you get from Harry Potter to Chasing Ice? A uh, little bit of a side curve, I guess. Um, I w when I was on Harry Potter on the first one, my husband Kurt was diagnosed with advanced colon cancer, and so we went through the journey of saving Kurt's life. And the day I returned back to London, um, I got a call from, to my desk, and it was uh, for a wish organization for a child's wish. And, and I realized nobody was doing that for the films, so I started doing that, and it became one of my main reasons to go to work. I just loved spending the day with these kids. They were from organizations all around the world. And um, so it... Uh, during rent, I decided to leave film and start a nonprofit to help families with critically ill children. And the first day that I started there with care, um, I launched it in Luis Sohoyas's photography studio. And he says, "You know, I'm going to be doing these a film and nonprofit. Maybe you can help me, and you know, we can pay you, and you can have a side job." And I was like, "Okay." That sounds good. So I literally retired like 
12 hours and discover documentary filmmaking. So I would do there with care during the day and the cove in the afternoons and evenings and it's just every weekend and and it's just evolved. I and I love it. It's it's amazing. It's it's a nice That's amazing. That is a great story. It, it's not financially the advice I would recommend to anyone, but... <laughs> Documentaries in general? Yes. Spiritually. Our karma, our karma account is yeah. heaping, <laughs> overflowing. That counts for a lot. That's an amazing story. I'm wondering, how has the film impacted people's perception, their attitudes, and their sense of urgency about climate change? Um, I don't know how you all feel, but... Um, for, for most of the audiences we've been screening the film for over the last year, there is a big sense of urgency, wanting to know what they can do, how they can get involved. And, and it's been very humbling to see people's reactions. Um, we had a, a screening in Utah with students and we asked them, you know, one girl said, do you hope this film will change, change people's perception on climate change? And we said, well, how many of you did this film change your perception? And three quarters of the hands went up. And then we said, well, how many of you would like to share it? And pretty much every hand came up. So we started seeing that more and more over the year. Um, there's been some pretty extreme cases. There was a woman who came out in Los Angeles from the theater and our volunteer started filming her with his phone. And you know, she was saying, I love Bill O'Reilly, I love Fox, and I came in here to snicker and sneer, and I couldn't move when the film ended. And I'm going home, and I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to undo everything I've done. And um, so, you know, there are cases like that, and it went kind of viral. And, you know, there are some extremes like that. But, but overall, I think for, for most of us, even for me, I had heard so much about climate change, but to see it was, was really powerful. And James's work really does that for us. Um, Josh, um, okay, as a climate scientist, we're, we're, we're seeing all of this and we understand that the reality is, is that this is what's going on and it seems huge, it seems so big. What could an individual do, what could we do so that we could feel like we have some form of power over, over what our future is? Yeah. Um, I before I answer that question, uh, I just want to thank the the filmmakers. Um, I this was my first time seeing the movie, uh, and I was really struck. Um, I think uh, you, you've really captured something here quite amazing. I've spent uh, a lot of time talking to the public about uh, climate change and global warming, and um, a little bit. I've always known that a, a lot of the most compelling stories are, uh, as James himself said, in the ice, but. I think this movie captured it in a way that I've never quite seen before. Um, it's really moving and very, um, it, it, it was, I was really impressed and, and amazed and, and kind of dumbfounded myself. So I, uh, I, I applaud you for, for capturing a, uh, a message that I've been struggling to convey so clearly for so long, uh, so well. So thank you. Um, Thanks, James Baylog. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I struggle with this question all the time myself. Of course, uh, the climate is changing. These are, these are as you said, uh, massive changes. We're raising the, uh, uh, the levels of CO2 above where they've been for millions of years. You may have heard in the news just a couple of weeks ago, in the last week or two, uh, we passed the 400 parts per million mark in the atmosphere. Um, so this is uh, a little bit of a, a wake-up call, a reminder that it's really time to, uh, to do something. And I think uh, uh, you know, we've had the planet on a sort of high-carb diet for the last 100 years, and it's time to go lean and get green. And um, I think that, uh, I think though that what can you do about it is a hard question. Of course, uh, everyone can play a role in reducing their carbon footprint. Uh, you can buy a more fuel efficient car, you can live close to where you work. 
Uh, you can um, turn off the lights when you leave, turn off the faucet when you're not brushing your teeth. Uh, but these are small things, and I think the thing that's important to remember is that this is a global problem. It is a, uh, every time we put a, a ton of carbon into the atmosphere, most of it is going to stay there for a thousand years, and our planet is going to continue to react to it for a thousand years. We do not yet have any, con uh, any technology to remove carbon from the atmosphere. So what we do today is going to be with us for generations. Uh, and I think that to really affect change, we have to do it at the highest levels. So I like to tell people that um, how you vote is as important as uh, planting a tree or buying a Prius. Uh, we really have to ask our policymakers for policies that have an impact on how we use energy and what kind of pollution and how much we put into the atmosphere. Thank you. And Josh, as a climate scientist, do you also see yourself as a climate advocate? And I wouldn't say the word activist, but I kind of wonder where you see yourself on that, on that scale. And are those roles in conflict? Um, I, I don't think they're in conflict. Um, and, and yes, I would consider myself an, an advocate for the climate. Um, uh, I'm not quitting my day job, though. I'm still going to be a climate scientist. Uh, and uh, um, I think that scientists have a responsibility to talk about climate change. Um, and um, I try and do that quite regularly. Uh, you know, I feel similarly responsible uh, as, uh, as James does, I think, in that um, conveying the message of what's happening is a huge part of my job and something I think that climate scientists have not done well uh, so far. Um, I actually have a, a, a story about a small run-in I had with Rush Limbaugh where he, he talked about one of our papers on the radio and he said, uh, he had this quote, he said, to overturn the world economy based on the musings of a few idiot leftist scientists is just stupid and that's what global warming is actually all about. Uh, so subsequent to that, um, my wife had me some business cards made where my job title is idiot leftist scientist. <laughs> Uh, so I don't know if that answers your question, but I think, um, I think we do have a responsibility as scientists to speak up, and I try and do that at every opportunity. Terrific. Paul. <laughs> um, you're one of the special scientists that address the connection between research and practicality. Um, for the writers in the room, can you talk to the urgency on how to express this connection in stories and, and again, to sort of allow people to feel some power in their own lives to affect any kind of change? I honestly, and, and I, I was thinking the same thing Josh was in terms of thanking the filmmakers for this. And to be honest, I think that, that in large part answers your question. One, one of the things that I was struck by in this, in this film is just how remarkably it, uh, it connects you not just to the issue at hand, but to the person behind the issue, right? This was really a story about James and his quest, right? And we got to learn about uh, his, his passion and how it damaged his knee and his effect on his family and everything that he and his entire team went through in order to get this. That, uh, the story of science and how it gets done, everything that Josh does in the lab every day of the week is at least as compelling as the facts that get published in the paper that Rush Limbaugh takes issue with. In fact, the, the, the stories behind there are the sorts of things that give, give rise to scientists that's, that, that are like Josh and say, I, I, have, I have a, and myself, I have a, I have a reason to do this. I, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, there's something in my gut that makes me not only get up in the morning to study this more, but to be a part of giving that to people who can communicate it effectively in film, on television, in newspaper articles, on the radio, to their friends, on Facebook, whatever it happens to be. All of those things, all of those stories are, are out there and they're rich, really, frankly, they're, they're incredibly rich. And, and they always involve the opportunity that you might crash in a helicopter. I, yeah, I guarantee, I'll bet I could ask Josh the number of times you might have died in the field. And I, 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 I could give you fun stories about when I've been in the field and these sorts of things. The reason that's important is because it connects every person to the human story that's here. Climate change isn't just about the ice that's melting uh, in the glaciers of our northern latitudes or in, in high mountains. 
Climate change is also the story of how a civilization that was built on 10,000 years of stable climate since the last ice age has decided to put itself, as, as Josh said, on a high carbon diet that's going to give us a climate we've never seen in the history of not only, not only humankind, but really the majority of, of any part of our evolutionary history. We don't know what this is going to look like. And that's a story that every single one of us can potentially relate to. Those stories connect the scientists that might be chasing tornadoes in Tornado Alley. They might be studying the, the, the wildfires in Russia. They might be looking at, at heat waves uh, in the Northeast that are causing blackouts that may result in deaths as a result of, of hot temperatures and no air conditioning. Every single one of those things is studied by scientists. Every single one of those things connects to actual individuals on the ground. And once you start seeing those connections, the same way we can connect with James, you start to see how it is that this not only is something theoretical, but it's really, it's a, it's a story of what we want in our daily lives, in our community. And frankly, you know, we're talking about civilization and the balance here. Uh, what is it that, that that connection can do for me and how it is that I can do something for, for, for humanity writ large. And th there really are solutions, as, as Josh eloquently said. So let me ask you about those. Uh, we know that the X Prize motto is making the impossible possible. So what can you tell us about the science and technology that's emerging that can help us solve these problems? So, so this is where uh, I think we can actually be a little bit optimistic, frankly. And and, and there, uh, Josh said this, I always say, I, I say the same thing. There's sort of three realms of solutions that are possible. There's policy, um, and frankly, we're actually doing a good job there. How many voted no on Prop 23 a couple of years ago? How many folks here voted no on the proposition that was trying to repeal AB 32? If you voted no on Proposition 23, you took a real action that resulted in a cap and trade program in California, the, lar the sixth or seventh largest economy today in the world is limiting its carbon emissions. Next year, we're going to link up with Quebec and actually have a larger market for that. That was a real policy action that real individuals had to vote in order to implement. So that's something that actually happened. Behavior. Josh mentioned all of the behavioral actions we can take. But there's a whole host of other sorts of things that are also a part of this. One of my favorite examples is in California, uh, the majority of carbon emissions are a result of transportation, us driving around. Most of that transportation is not on your commute. It's in daily activities that you do. And in fact, the largest amount of congestion of any time of day, can anybody guess when that is? When the most congestion on the roads happens? Nope. Nope. It's close to 7 a.m. Drop off at schools. How many of you walked to school when you were a kid? How many of you have kids or grandkids that walk to school today? The schools haven't moved. Those are real behavioral changes that we've made as a society, culturally, as well as how we've built our towns and cities. I, I don't like letting my daughter walk across Ventura Boulevard. That, that scares the hell out of me, frankly. Uh, but those are real behavioral changes that, 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 that have a serious impact on our actual carbon emissions and, and my commute. The last one that you're getting at, technology. We really do have to get off of our carbon-based economy. The entire global economy is based on fossil fuels. The reason we're here today, we have lights, the reason that we can drive around, we have iPhones, all of the great benefits of our, of our wealth in the Western world and growing wealth in the developing world, particularly China and India, is based on fossil fuels. We're not going to get rid of that good life, nor should we. It's elevated people out of poverty. It's stopped, uh, it's stopped in many places uh, massive amounts of, 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 uh, of fatality and death. It's, it's, it's improved the lives of billions. So how can we do it in a way that doesn't also result in the massive death of billions in the future? Uh, that's where we need real technology shifts. And that's a place where I'm, I love working at XPRIZE because we literally are about radical breakthroughs for the benefit of humanity. And that means, what are the technology shifts? What are the dreams that you can have that you, you, need, to, you need to see happening next? That means a carbon capture and, and recycling prize. That means a breakthrough battery prize that will allow us to store energy on the grid, power electric aircraft, and make sure that all of our, all of our, uh, all of our energy that comes from solar and wind can actually be stored for the times that the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. And we're launching these prizes over the next few years. You'll see, see these sorts of things because, frankly, they're possible. The technology isn't that crazy. We just need to get the world's attention and capital and innovation and innovative capacity focused on it. And that's one of the things that XPRIZE does by launching these massive 10-plus million dollar prizes. Wow. Okay. Thank you. We'd like to open this up to Q&A with the audience. And what we'd like to do is take three questions at a time. 
So if you let the runners with the mics know, raise your hand. I'll hit, okay, here's one, two, and do we have three? Three. Thank you. you want me to start? Yeah. Okay. Uh, you know, I was thinking, uh, if you've ever heard of the uh, humorist Robert Benchley, he once said that there are only two kinds of people in the world, those who believe that there are only two kinds of people in the world and those who don't. Um, I, I've come to believe that there are, there are two, only two kinds of people in this, with this topic. There are those who don't believe in climate change because they don't want to believe in climate change, taking the, you know, the, the path of least resistance. And then there are those, the rest of us, who do believe in climate change in spite of the fact that we don't want to believe in climate change. Um, and I'm wondering, when is the fight going to be taken to the climate change deniers to, um, I lost my train of thought, uh, to, to, to attack their motivations. Because right now, they're on the attack. They have the tactical high ground. And it's about time that the, that the dynamic of the argument is turned around. OK, thank you. Let's take the second question. OK, uh, I wrote my question. So to be sure that I'm going to be understood. Uh, first of all, I, I'm very, very happy that I wanted to learn more and I have came here to see this movie. So congratulations to every one of you that collaborate for it. So that's a great thing. And I think that movies are having so big impact and helps you to learn so fast. So my question is connected to images. So how do you think that the young generation, younger than me, right? will emotionally be touched by those images, as in our time, um, they are so used to see visual effects, which they create so huge changes, and they are just used to see that. Uh, do you have any knowledge, if it is any program or idea, how visual effects can bring the global warming more present? Thank you. Thank you. Take one more. Uh, mine's very, very simple. Um, with any of the cameras, did you guys focus on permafrost at all? And do you have any footage of permafrost melting? Okay. I, I want to start with the first question. And I know uh, th I mean, this is, um, I think we are actually winning. And I think this picture is proof of it. And, and the reason I say that is my job or our job uh, first is to entertain folks. Um, that's when you want to make a film, a feature film, you want to make sure you're entertaining people or else no one will see it and whatever message you're giving, no one will get it. And when we started making this film, you know, uh, Al Gore had made his documentary and, and it had become an issue and then the pendulum swung. And uh, you had things like the email scandal and suddenly it was like, oh, it's not real. Climate change is not real. And when we started making this film, they were winning because we actually sat in a room, when I say we, Jeff, basically, Jeff and myself, uh, Paula, Jerry, and we thought to ourselves, now we can't make it too political. We're going to get crushed out there because right now we're getting crushed. And if we want anyone to see the film, we want a Republican to see the film, we can't just stand up and say, you know, this, this is absolutely real. The deniers are absolutely full of, you know, whatever. And over the course of making the film, particularly, I would say, from Paula and from Jerry, we became emboldened by what we were doing. <laughs> and we started saying to ourselves, what are we doing? Of course it has to be about James Baylog. Well, the, the first incarnation of the film was all about James Baylog, and it was a very much more personal story, particularly about the boys, the kids, I call them, and James, and this adventure. And it wasn't nearly as confrontational. And over the course of making the film, we you know, realize what we had. And so I do think that we are winning. And I think that, that we knew that this version would be more entertaining. And that's why, so. Well, we, that's actually a very good way to descri describe the evolution for us. And what we kept saying to ourselves was, we can't do this because this is a political issue and, and it's polarizing and we don't, we want to, come around another way to show people what's happening. 
And then we, when we sat in the room, we said, why is this a political issue? Why is this issue politicized? It affects every person that needs water, air, food, who has children, who has young people in their lives. And that's when we felt more empowered to say, let's just put it out there and make it accessible as much as we can for everyone because this issue affects everyone. And for us to buy into this, it's a political issue, is nonsense. You know, that's, that's truly what the realization for us. And it took us a long time to get there. And, and once we realized that, we, we really felt that it was something we had to stand up for. Um, to, I don't have the, the questions, but I can answer that one. I don't remember all the questions. But um, I just want to answer your question about the cameras. Um, the other things that James has been shooting, and now, so he was starting this as just a five-year project, and I've been on this for five years. It's been going on for seven and now he started a nonprofit and he's continuing other ways of visual evidence of climate, of the effects of climate change through air. He's been um, in Colorado where we all live. We've had this horrible pine beetle just destroying our forest. He's been documenting with the time lapse photography, the, pi the pine beetle, the, the sandstorms. He, he's really, he's now taking cameras in the southern hemisphere. So, it's a, it's a real passion for him now to figure out other ways to share the visual evidence. I wanted to say just one thing about the first question again. I think that it's, it's interesting. We're, the, the world that we're in right now, everyone seems to have a voice. And a lot of news organizations or editorially news organizations um, are supported by um, big corporations. And you know it's sort of the politics and the corporations there, there's a lot of input for what they do. However, I think that our community, the entertainment industry, is really unified in being a believer, as you said, and but not, not being happy about it, but believing it. And I think that the personal story is like, like Mark was saying, whenever, whenever you can link something to someone's, you know, their how, you know, in their home with their family all of a sudden the urgency becomes undeniable. And I think having, having documentaries out there and having the facts out there talking about how things truly link, like, you know, if, if you see, you know, watching this film, you could see that the, wa that the ice melts, the water rises, a hurricane comes, and the devastation is, is more. Um, that makes sense. We're not, you know, for, even for somebody who's denying it, they could say, well, there's always been hurricanes. But there hasn't been this much exposure to the population. So these are stories that I, these are elements that especially in TV, I mean, like, you know, there's, especially with our shows, you guys need stories every second. And there's a different catastrophe that happens every week. So I think, you know, as we were talking about, and as Paul was talking about, fact is greater than fiction here. And, you know, just linking it and making it personal, I think we can overcome whatever the talking heads are doing for whatever their agendas are. I think that w the power that, that the scripted world has is enormous. I just want to add, Mark used that analogy or the metaphor of the pendulum swinging uh, the other way on this issue. I hate that analogy. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, it's OK. Uh, it gave me an opportunity to make this comment. Um, uh, the reason I hate it is because uh, political issues aren't pendulums. Pendulums swing on their own free will, and these issues are pushed and pulled and yanked. And um, what happened during that period was that the other side just kind of beat us up. Uh, and there is, a, you know, I um, oftentimes in talking about climate uh, denial and, and so forth, um, people, people level a finger at scientists and say that scientists are just um, in a huge conspiracy to soak up all this grant money and, and you know, the more controversial they are, the more grant money they get, um, which is not true, actually. Uh, grant money doesn't just run like a faucet out and of DC. If you've seen the federal it's, budget, that's right. not it's, really worth No, it's not. What, that's <laughs> not high on the hog. That's not um, a huge amount of money. Right, it's not a huge mountain. But, uh, but it's ironic, I think, because there is actually a conspiracy, and I don't use that word lightly, um, to deny that climate change is really happening. There is a small, well-funded group of people who spend their entire time, they are paid full-time, to make up false stories 
to convince people that global warming is not real. I get emails from some of them on a regular basis. Uh, there's a guy named Mark Morano who used to work for Senator Inhofe. He was one of uh, the one of the people talking heads at the beginning of the movie. Um, and uh, he, a couple times a week, sends out uh, emails to a huge uh, list, including a lot of reporters uh, for a lot of the news agencies we're all familiar with, uh, that have talking points and ways to refute um, ongoing science issues that are all uh, carefully crafted to sound very believable and, and sound very convincing, uh, and are by and large patently false. So there is this uh, push. Um, it's, it's not our imagination. And, and while I, I blame climate scientists to a certain degree for being um, poor communicators and not talking clearly about the issue, uh, there is this force out there pushing people um, to, into disbelief about climate change, which is a convenient position to be in if, uh, because of, uh, uh, as we said earlier, the, the, you know, the economy really depends on it. Can I just real quickly also try and ask, answer all three questions? Because the nice thing about each of these, and I, I agree completely with everyone said, uh, there's a lot of polling data that actually shows that that we're winning this 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 argument, and that's for a few reasons. This polling data actually goes back quite a ways, and in the mid 1990s, there was no difference between Republicans and Democrats in their perception of climate change. Zero. That includes congressional Republicans and Democrats, uh, and that was that's been polled basically since then. Uh, and the big change, the big shift, the big division between those two parties happened in the year 2000. Why is that? Al Gore and George Bush. Al Gore became identified, for all the good he's done, he became identified as a politician with the climate issue. I mean, this has been a passion of his for many, many years. And that, that, that helped kick off all of the sorts of things that, that, that Mark and, and Josh were describing in terms of this this anti-science bias fixated on climate change. Of course, anti-science bias has existed in many forms for quite a long time. Now, that said, uh, y scientists aren't out there to convince people. Y you know, it doesn't matter if you're a crazy leftist scientist. The science itself is still objective fact. And that objective fact is going to come home to roost no matter what, you know, uh, w what anyone says about it. And the, the real shift just in the last couple of years in some of this polling data has started to track, and there's some good evidence for it, started to track some of the real massive disasters we've seen in the United States. This is everything from Irene and Sandy. They, you know, in, the, in the film, 2011 was the largest insurance payout year of ever. 2012 surpassed that because you had things like Sandy. You had massive drought throughout most of the Southwest and Midwest that, is, that, that, that also impacted a number, number of people uh, in those areas, including conservative red states. And you're starting to see this tracking, the, these, these, uh, uh, these things, and the polling data starting to show now, now a majority of Americans do believe climate change is happening. And not quite a majority think it's due to human activity. So we're close to, to a point that hasn't existed basically since the 1990s. All as a result of what scientists in large part have been saying forever and the fact that people are starting to get the fact that, uh, that not only is this, this a coming problem, but honestly we can do something about it that isn't going to kill off the global economy. Wind farms in Texas has the largest number of wind farms in, in, in the country. Uh, wind farms aren't killing the economy, the oil economy of Texas. In fact, what they're doing is propping up the energy economy uh, of many, of, many of, uh, of the poor farmers of West Texas. It's actually lots of solutions in there that are driving this change forward. And uh, that helps answer the second question. All of these are images you can talk about that, that, that really impact individual lives that are more than just uh, polar bears and the ice caps. These are sorts of things that are, that are happening here, now, every day uh, that are directly in line with what it is climate scientists have been predicting for many years would happen if climate change were to come about. In other words, it's because of climate change. Well, we have only five minutes left, probably only four at this point. So maybe we could take how many more? Two more minutes. So let's take one question, and, and then we'll close. more of a statement, actually. I've been in this movement for 40 years, and thank you so much for doing this. And I think an important thing is that how this is spinning exponentially. A friend of mine at the UN said, what we're seeing now in the last couple of years is like an hors d'oeuvre to what's coming. So there is a sense of urgency. And a couple of years ago, I was in Sweden at the Tauberg Forum, and I had dinner with this, a chief justice from Amsterdam. And He's, he's put together something where we're literally going to create lawsuits, crimes against humanity to these big corporations who, don't ask me why, they have enough money in homes for 10 years, I mean lifetimes, but 
actually where it will affect them and their children and their grandchildren financially. So that's been put together. And then secondly, we've created a team to do PSAs where we're doing them like in Times Square and in movie theaters. Um, we're doing them like for foster care and everything, but the power of PSAs is something. Imagine Times Square if we showed these glaciers. You know, it's gotta be grassroots. And that's just my opinion, and thank you. So. Uh, can I just say yeah, one quick. thing? I just wanted to say one thing to all of you because I think what you are able to do is so powerful. And as a mom with two boys, it's it's so important for these kids. And when I saw this footage, I didn't know what to do. I'm not an activist. I didn't know how to get involved, but I knew how to produce. So I was able to give my service for five years on this project as well as the other producer and Jeff, the director, and our attorneys, and like two thirds of our budget was donated. And so what I just wanna encourage you is because you all have amazing skills as writers and producers to find out how you can plug into the solution because you, you are gonna be able to reach so many people with your talents, so thank you for that. Can I second that and talk to the grassroots? Because I think you're, we often forget the power uh, that, this, that, that we wield globally here. What can one person do? Well, if you happen to be in the industry, you can influence the entire world. And you can tell the stories of how we can solve this problem in our own daily lives, how we can get kids to walk to school in LA. And if you can tell that story, does anybody think LA is a green city? We're trying. Well, we are trying. <laughs> and let's tell the story about how LA is trying and actually changing things. And if you change the most important city in the most important state in the most important country in the world, which is LA, You've, you're changing the world. I mean, one individual at a time has m exponential impact from a grassroots level, particularly because we can tell stories from here that the whole world will hear. Okay, and to, toward that end, please contact Emma and Hollywood Health and Society if you're a writer or producer and you want to tell these stories and you want access to some of these experts. We're here to connect you. And please join me in thanking the filmmakers, the scientists, the panelists. <laughs>